Um, we are absolutely delighted and very enthusiastic to be here. Um, we appreciate it's the last session, but I can tell you now, you're going to love what we're about to show you. So, as you all are aware, Legs Masters have been around for a while now. We have just launched our first position paper, and it's called Making Legs Matter. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to really reshape the care across the UK. We are proud to be able to launch this evening in association with the Tissue Viability, and we give thanks to Mark Allen Group for doing this with us, our great position paper. And the focus of this is really clear and simple, and it really wants to embrace the case for system change and transformation in lower limb care across the whole of the UK. So I just want to start with a few questions, really. A questions to you. I want to ask you as a clinician, do you believe the NHS delivers high quality evidence-based wound care? Maybe some of you recognise that there are failures. Maybe some of you the believe, believe the actual NHS achieves this currently. So let me put it another way. Do you believe that all patients across all healthcare settings have equal access to high quality limb care? If this was one of your patients and family, would you be happy for them to access any system across the UK? Would you be happy for your friends and family to potentially have a restricted access to evidence based care? As we know, that this is what happens across the UK. I think when we put it like that, we all can recognise that across the UK, we have a number of people that we are currently failing. We do cause increased suffering from our delays, our lack of evidence-based care, the elongation and the postcode lottery. And we as Legs Matter have to ask, how can this be right? How can we accept this as a nation? How can we accept this as an individual healthcare professional? So my final question to you is, what do you believe Legs Matters stand for? Because we know, we have a clear mission, we have a clear destiny if you like. We are here, we exist to change that status quo. We're here to call out that toxic culture that's within our culture, within the NHS for lower limb care. We are the one that's happy to paint the reality on the wall. It doesn't matter how ugly that picture may look at the minute, we all have to face that reality. And we are prepared to say what is needed. And that's exactly what we have done in this position statement. It is available free to download for every single one of you that's watching tonight and I urge you to download it and share it as wide as possible. As we believe this document will really highlight the reality as faced by many patients today. We think it's got the power to force the conversations in the correct direction. This document presents that real state of play with lower limb care. And it really builds on the evidence that's out there in terms of best evidence based practice. But it's designed to grab the hearts and the mind of the readers, whether that be in a commissioner, a service a provider, or a service leader. We really want these words that we've chosen carefully to be rather hard hitting and emotive in places you might not even like what you are reading but unfortunately, it is the reality. It has been designed for healthcare providers, service leaders and commissioners, and also industry, to really focus on thinking about what is the current reality? Where are we currently taking the whole of the lower limb service? Trying to make people question, are they really delivering gold standard care? We would urge you all to read, reflect, and use our test the thinking sessions to ensure that all of your services is providing that high quality patient care that every single patient deserves. We have provided a voice for our service users. 
we have expressed their concerns. These are the words that we hear as clinicians every single day. These are the words that's been sent to us as the Legs Matters campaign. These are comments that many of you out there will have heard every single day. But these comments actually fall completely silent. The Legs Matters campaign has give these patients a voice. We have really called it out in terms of how the system is currently failing our patients with a hope to paint a new, brighter future. So I would like to stop my screen sharing and I would really like to explore some of the contents of the document in a little bit more depth with my colleagues who's joined me here tonight. So hopefully I've now stopped sharing and hopefully you can now see us all. So there's many of us on this call, we've got a strict timeline to fit to. So first off, I would love to introduce Christine O'Connor and bring her into this conversation. Alison, uh, sorry, Sarah has already provided us with great introductions, so we won't waste time doing that. But I just want to ask Christine really a few questions relating to our document. Within this document, we call out the first step must be recognising that there is a problem out there. Why is this so important, Christine? Okay, so I, I think this is such an important question and very fitting in the context of the fact that we're sitting in the middle of a TVS conference where everybody's been talking about best practice, good things to do and all that kind of thing. And do you know what? It set me thinking that actually we're telling ourselves what we already know. What we're doing is reinforcing what we already know, but we're not pushing it out. We're not, we're not doing anything. We constantly recognize the problem, but we have to get other people to share that recognition. And I think this document starts that process, but it only starts it, Leanne, if we actually take it in our sweaty little palms and do something with it. And I think that's really the important thing we've got to take away from this today. And then within this, completely, uh, completely agree, Christine, and we need all our followers to get behind us with this to make it a success. But, you know, we use the word transformational change. You're, uh, this is, I think, one of your greatest of words that you band about a lot. But what does that truly mean? So uh, I think we all talk about transformation, you know, and we all think we're doing it. And the problem we face at the moment is we're, we've, we all say to each other, we've got problems with workforce. Uh, we're having, we're being forced to embrace digital. We've got all these issues that we're facing. And actually, this is all the signs that we have to change the way we work. That's all of us. It's not other people. It's not, it's, this is not a message for people outside of this co co collection here. It's for every single person. So every TVN needs to think about the work. Every DN needs to think about the way they're working. Every single person in the system has to really embrace the need to change. And that means we have to look at how we do things and think about how we're going to do it differently. You know, in Accelerate, we kind of do this all the time because nothing stands still. And therefore we have to make ready to do these things. And you know what, when you're a small organization, it pushes you into that direction. And I think everybody who's part of the big service has got to start thinking about that and thinking about what does it mean for them personally and how do they push in to make things different? Because also in this document, we haven't been fearful of actually spelling out that at the moment there is complicit failure complicit failure that we all just accept we accept those patients words that i that i provided on my presentation we accept them as the norm as the expected well, what do you think that this message means to our service users that we're happy with this complicit failure you know you know i, th I think the issue here is sometimes people get worn down don't they you know, we've all been in a place where we've been trying hard to do stuff, but we we get worn down by the system. I think with the new environment that we're going into, I don't think we can afford to feel worn down because, you know, you only get so many chances at making change happen. And the door is kind of slightly ajar at the moment. And whilst we might not be on the agenda, it's how do we get ourselves there? We cannot any longer accept complicit. We are part of the problem because we're accepting it. We're saying, I can't do anything about this. And yet we have to actually stand up and be counted 
and actually say, well, I'm not accepting that any longer. I cannot be part of complicit failure. I have to do something, even if we do it as a whole group and do something about that with Legs Matter, with TVS, and get everybody behind this to say, we will no longer accept that we are part of complicit failure. And then, so with that, do you think that lower limb conditions are currently on anybody's widest agenda in terms of the health fraternity? Okay, I'll tell you whose agenda they're on, Leanne, ours. They're on our agenda. But are they on anybody else's? No. Because if you look at what are being, what's being asked of ICSs, of place-based care, of provider co collaborations, it's all about the big ticket items. Now, we did a session earlier today and we talked, we, you know, we referred to that guest data that everybody knows and looks at it and goes, oh, isn't it terrible? But it never gets on anybody's agenda. OK, but we have to push forward. We have to somehow get it on there. And do you know what? Lower limb management and looking at population health management, it's an easy place to go to to actually start to show what is possible to do if you actually force people through the eye of the needle. So it's it's in our hands to get ourselves in that place. Nobody's going to do it for us. We've got to do it. And, and many people would say that the National Wound Care Strategy is doing something towards that, but actually they're only providing the clinical recommendations. They're not going to actually implement or force the change. As you said, that's actually down to us. You mentioned uh, integrated care systems that's coming yeah. into being within the next few months. Um, I, I see those as a threat in terms of going around the cycle of a new management structure again. Uh, but also an opportunity. What, what do you think in terms of lower limb care and um, with the creation of the ICSs? Okay, I think I think ICSs can be a threat. I do think they can be a threat because they're going to be very tightly managed and very tightly uh, uh, pushed to deliver on certain areas. I mean, they have to deliver on personalization, which I spoke about earlier in, in the conference. They have to deliver on the digital strategy and digital maturity and will be measured against this. But more than anything, they're going to be measured against how effectively they deliver population health management. Now, population health management is not just about the medical stuff. It's about the wider determinants of health and actually taking that into account. A bit of some of that stuff that Lindsay Leg Club were talking about to a degree there. And I think what you've got to do is you've got to get close to people locally. Each, each TVN, each service has got to find a way to get through cracks in armor, whether it's at primary care network level, whether it's at, at higher provider level, but find a way through to say, do you know what? If we work together, we can actually demonstrate to the ICS ways of doing things differently and, and ways of looking at things differently. That's the only way we're going to do it, apart from the bigger thing, Leanne, which is about how TVS, Legs Matter, people like that come together to influence the changes that can happen. They need hooks in the ICS. They do not have answers. And, and, you know, it's a slow burn at the moment because people are not in post. And when there's people not in post, there's always opportunity. So you have to just look for it. And the opportunity lies with us. Nobody's Absolutely. going to present this opportunity. No. Nobody's going to knock on our door. We need to be knocking on their door and knocking Absolutely. on their door now. 100%, 100%, Leanne. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much, Christine, uh, for that. So part of our um, section within this document is called the status quo is no longer acceptable and that we must change it. And actually, when we think about this, there is no greater person to actually talk to us about this status quo than actually a person who's lived this experience. And I'd like to invite Tracy um, into the conversation. Um, Tracy is a patient who's had a lower limb condition for a number of years. And Tracy provides great value um, to the Legs Matters Committee. So. Welcome, Tracy. So I just want to ask you a question, if, if that's OK. What difference do you think a person um, with experience actually brings to the table of Legs Matters? Um, and how do you think this has influenced this document? Well, I think it's absolutely vital to have somebody there with the experience, because as much as all the clinicians know 
and you're all experts um, and you, you know you can never really understand what it's like to actually experience that lower leg condition um, as much as I tell people you still would never know and imagine just sort of every part of your life that gets affected by it um, you know as a patient around the legs matter table I've always been treated as an equal and all my opinions are taken seriously um, and I think with this document in particular um, the patients that worked on it they they did have an influence especially on the bit that talked about um, the patient's needs and expectations. And, and I'd like to bring, uh, thank you for that, Tracy, and completely agree. And, you know, I can always remember on one of our first meetings, we were talking about, um, I think it was recurrence and non-compliance, and you're going, what do those terminologies mean? And we use them so bandedly around, you know, especially the non-compliant word, that our patients don't even know what that means. So along with Tracy, I'd like to invite into the conversation as well, Alison. So Tracy and Alison's just going to do a bit of a double act, if that's okay. So, so really a question to both of you. Um, we talk about known inequalities for patients um, with lower limb conditions across the NHS. Um, what does Legs Matter um, stand on for this? And, and can this document address any of those inequalities? So I think I'd like to ask Tracy first, if that's all right, and then bump to Alison. Yeah, sure. Um, I think legs matter. One of the most important things that we're trying to get across is that it shouldn't be a lottery depending on where you live. It should be across the board. Good care for everybody, no matter where you live and who you see. Perfect. Alison? I think what we're trying to do with this document is open people's eyes to this lottery. And uh, I think often we just look at our own situation. So say someone that works in a leg ulcer clinic, they should be rightly proud of their work. But what they're not necessarily seeing is the variation across and within services. So, uh, you know, this document is hopefully helping people to see the bigger picture and the variation in care that's happening out there. And there's more evidence on that in, in other sources. But I think also, um, I think it's really important that um, when we're dealing with someone um, and we're looking at their journey and we're providing the care um, or you hear about a bad story that, that a patient suffers, we think that that's a one off, really. We hope that it's a one off. But actually, this document is saying this is not a one off. This, you know, sometimes patients were saying, I remember um, the gentleman that used to work on uh, Legs Matter as well. And he, he said once, you know, I hope what I had was a rarity. And unfortunately, it was like the, the non-compliance conversation with Tracy. It was like, oh dear, do you not realize this is way bigger than just your experience? And so whilst this is uncomfortable reading, we have to open up people's eyes to this variation and the lack of fairness, the lack of justice for some people where it is such a lottery. So that's what I hope for this document. And, and I think that we have to actually acknowledge that actually with leg ulcer care, it's probably the better of the lot. When you talk about lymphedema or the care of foot ulcer in a non-diabetic patient, the lottery gets worse and worse of the odds of actual success and remember that legs matter stands for all lower limb conditions so we want to approve it across the board yeah. within the document though this this document does say we are ashamed to hear we are ashamed to hear about the failure of our patients and about their experience and their negative experience of actually going ignored why have we chosen to highlight it in, in such a way, do you think? Oh, this is a, such an interesting one. And as a group, we, we had quite a long discussions about this because they were strong words <clears throat> and we used them carefully and we were quite apprehensive about the strong language we were using. But the thing is, the bottom line was we knew that this was all true. And so we had to sort of, you know, gather ourselves together and go this this is actually true we don't want it to be true and we know people are working really really hard and also nurses don't like to criticize other colleagues it's a hard one right but 
we know that this is true and and i suppose again my hope is that this will strengthen our resolve to be truthful about the landscape that we work within the lottery that is an absolute reality for people um, and that as clinicians we have to acknowledge that and go okay for the for the bigger picture we have to understand that for for the population that something needs to be done um, and it's just critically important and that comes back to doesn't it of actually understanding the reality of where we are today yeah. Yeah. and within the document you know we have said that patient needs and preferences preferences are not currently at the heart of treatment they're not in many cases and, and tracy what do you think about your experiences and, and what you hear about this issue from from somebody with lived experience um i've lost count of how many heartbreaking stories i've heard of people receiving bad care and not being listened to um so as as some of you will know i was fortunate enough to receive really good care but the trauma of having that lower leg condition for so many years will, will stay with me forever so when I think about having to deal with all those day to day struggles on top of people, you know, these poor people that have to have inconsistent care and poor care and they're not being listened to, it, it just breaks my heart for them. I just think it's so, so important for the patient's needs and preferences to be right at the forefront of their care, because that's what's going to lead to success. And, and why shouldn't it be, Tracy? How are we allowing it not to be, is what I would question with that. It has to be at the heart of everything that we do. And actually, we have highlighted in this document that the way our systems are set up actually forces dependency of that patient onto the NHS rather than that patient empowerment. We sort of feel that it's inevitable that they will become dependent on us, unmanageable, consequence will happen and what do you think that that means you know to the patients in terms of the attitude if i can ask alison first and then we'll just get the final words from tracy i think um it doesn't have to be inevitable um i think uh we have talked much more lately about um supported self-care and and as uh, christine did earlier recommend the uh, the talk on citizen empowerment um, we have to have a different um, strategy um, because our workforce needs a different strategy than trying to just think we can fix everyone in um, with our hands. Um, it needs a partnership approach, and that's really important. And the, the opportunity is there, there to have that. So, um, you know, we need to use um, the power that we have to change that. Tracy? I agree. I think for some patients, obviously, they're not able to do the, the care at home, um, so it needs to be a partnership. But for me personally, um, when I was given that bit of, of uh, independence, if you like, it meant that I didn't have to come to the hospital every week with two small children. It meant I didn't have to fit in with the schedule of the clinic. Um, so for those patients that are able to self-care at home alongside the clinician and be able to get that advice, I, I think that's definitely the way forward. It's that patient choice and patient empowerment and allowing them, isn't it? Thank you. And just very finally, um, Alison, I have to question, do you think we as healthcare professionals have inadvertently created a toxic culture? That's a harsh phrase, of course, um, but um, it, I, I don't know if I'd quite use that phrase, but what I would say is that we should listen to the language that we use and our beliefs come out in our language and our behavior. And there are some phrases that we in Legs Matter try to ban. One of them is non-compliance because it's such a powerful phrase, it's not helpful. And it also alters your perspective on that human in front of you. There's a different way of managing that. And, and this document, again, uh, I hope that challenges people to look at it sort of really in your face document and go, do we have to talk about people like this? I think it's impossible to read this document without some inward reflection. And I think even every one of us, when we, we've written this document, when we read it back in print, we all inwardly reflected.
Yeah. Thank you very much. So, Thank Margaret, you. if I could bring you into the conversation, if that's OK, another of the sections, we don't want to be all doom and gloomy within this document. One of the sections is actually to say that we can solve the lower limb challenge, but we stress that there is a lack of measurement within lower limb care. Yeah. So, so why do you think measurement is so important? Well, um, thanks, Leanne. I think taking baseline measurements of the size of a wound or the site and degree of swelling or pain um, is really important. And then reassessing that, measuring it regularly, gives clear signs on whether treatment strategies are being effective or not. If they are being effective, it's a fabulous boost to patient and to practitioner. But if they're not, it's just so wrong to continue with ineffective care. And we all want to give good care. Nobody gets up in the morning and thinks, I'm going to give poor care today. But we're a bit afraid of, of measuring things and being shown that we might not be getting it right. And I think we need to go over that um, and see it as opportunities. There are some useful benchmarks for success. Um, for example, the National Wound Care Strategy states we should expect substantial reduction in the size of the wound within 12 weeks. If that's not happening, it shouldn't be seen as failure, but perhaps a need for a different approach and maybe time to refer to another specialist. So there are opportunities. And, and I think that the measurement bit is the thing that we have become rubbish at across the, the NHS with lower limb care. Because there's a measurement of an individual patient. How am I doing with that individual patient? There's a measurement in terms of the service of how are they doing and benchmarking. And then there's a measurement of the NHS in terms of what are we providing? Is that actually success? And I think that we need the measurements in place across all of those. So, so you know, how do you think that we solve that, that measurement challenge, let's say? I think ideally everyone would collect data um, that can be compared nationally. And if people are implementing national policy, um, such as with the national wound care strategy, rather than local policy, there is guidance and um, it makes comparison much easier. Uh, minimum data sets are also being developed for chronic edema and the British Lymphology Society can help direct people to um, support for this. But the minimum standard um, should be collecting local data that can be shared and compared with your own colleagues and don't need to reinvent the wheel. Local commissioner groups or health board support services should be able to help and share basic data if requested. But I think it's important just to get started with something it can be very basic as long as it's consistent and it includes all your patients so that you can start to see patterns where there can be improvements. And I think actually the data can become very powerful in making the case for change in terms of prevention. Because there's one thing that the NHS claims it does, but it doesn't do, I don't believe in any form of lower limb care, is that absolute prevention that we need. So do you think it's acceptable, Margaret, for prevention not to be currently commissioned for lower limb it, care? Absolutely not. I mean, if preventative care is not commissioned, it's sending a clear message that it's less important than everything else. Um, we've got evidence of the misery that uh, lower limb uh, problems cause and the detrimental it has on individuals, but society as well. And that's before we even think about um, the huge unnecessary cost to health services and the burden on health professionals. So how can we justify the harm done to patients by failing to encourage primary preventative strategies and also when people develop problems there's almost a secondary um, preventative approach needed in preventing complications by addressing them early promptly and ensuring the appropriate treatment so absolutely it's not acceptable and, and, you know, again, it comes down to a postcode lottery of disease conditions. Within peripheral arterial disease, there's a lot of secondary prevention, secondary prevention of heart attacks and strokes. But every single person out there appears to turn a blind eye to soft, small edema. We just go, oh, your legs are a bit swollen and walk away. And I really question 
why are we able to do that both as an individual as in a health fraternity that that lack of opportunity we are pushing our patients down a line of misery to be for continued suffering as you know, um, within this document, one of the things that we are the greatest proud of is the fact that this document has been endorsed by the Queen's Nursing Institute of England and of Scotland. And actually, when you think about how hard hitting this document is, they could have easily shied away from endorsing this. And I take my hat off to them for being so brave to be able to put their name to this document. And I think it just really calls out the size of this problem. So, Margaret, just to summarise in a very few words, why do you think the prestigious uh, Q&I were happy to endorse this document? I think undoubtedly they recognise there are problems um, and they did comment that um, the document has clear, no-nonsense messages um, supported by powerful data and evidence and brought to life, really, by um, patient experience stories. But they also were very pleased that it contained so much um, practical information and support and guidance. So although it is hard hitting, it's strong stuff, it should help nurses to make changes in practice. And they are really keen to disseminate the document widely and encourage people to be looking at it and questioning current practice. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Margaret. Um, and then finally, we have another section, the final section within the document is called test your thinking. And we actually ask and pose a number of questions to actually get the little brain spinning. So, so I'd like to welcome Jill to the conversation as our final panelist. Um, and I'd just like you to tell us a little bit more really about that test the thinking. Why do we design it in such a way? I think it's it's made really to to touch everybody's heart and to get everybody stimulated in, in questioning their practice really, questioning what they do and questioning what can they change? Where are the key drivers in all of this? Where are the people that can make this change? Where are the ones that are passionate about what we do for a living? Where are the ones that get out of bed in the morning, like Margaret says, and want to make a difference? So I think it's it's around us testing people's knowledge and skills and making sure that what we do is right and to the best of our ability and supporting patients. And I think as well, the patients are the key drivers. I, I really support what Tracy says. And I think that patients have a big voice. Patients are the ones that will make the key changes. Like Christine mentioned, the cracks in the armour. I think the patients can recognise that. Key drivers like enthusiastic traces in the world are the people that will really make the difference to us. And I think that we need to call out that our test the thinking pages is not just a bit of nurse bashing. In fact, actually, our test the thinking pages, there's a page for commissioners to actually question, do you know what you are paying for? Is it delivering what it should be? There's a test the thinking page for the service leaders in terms of do you really know your outcomes of what your service is providing? And there's a test the thinking page for industry in terms of how they use that terminology of those certain types of wounds to be able to really think about are they doing the best they possibly could to change that overall culture? So we've talked about the culture being slightly toxic at time. We've talked about the need for the changing culture. But Jill, why do you think it's important to change the culture? I think we have to change the culture. And I think, you know, maybe having had a, a pandemic, it's been horrendous. We're, maybe we're coming out the other side, maybe we're not. But it's certainly made us think about the way we work and the way we practice. We've got to work smarter in what we do. And I quite agree with Christine, we've been tested on, on the e-technology, different ways of working collaboratively with different professions, whether it be social care, healthcare, and the holistic approach to that patient. So I think we've got to change with the culture and I don't think the pandemic is going very far. It's something that we've got to, well, swallow if you like, and, and work very smartly in our approach to the management of wounds. Um, we've had some really good presentations all today, one being around self-management, and I think we need to start empowering the patients, as Tracy said, into giving them their independence and where we're getting bigger caseloads and less staff. So we have to think of ways to manage that more, more 
effectively really. And, and I echo all of what you said, Jill. I think it's the culture that's desperate to be changed. It's a culture that a nurse thinks the leg also should heal quickly. We want a culture where gross edema is abnormal, that we tackle it earlier on, that we do not accept any form of long-term chronic wound. We should be fighting with these wounds to get them to heal as soon as possible. I'd like to thank my panel. We will be back for questions in a little while. I urge you all, we have got 20 minutes for questions. So please, please put the questions on. And I just want to share my screen again, if that's possible, just to show you a few last nights. So hopefully you can see my screen again. I like to make things complicated, obviously. So um, I'd just like to say a few thank yous, really. Um, I'd like to thank Mark Allen Group for their brilliant support and energy of bringing this together. It certainly wouldn't have been possible without them. I'd like to thank the uh, company sponsors, um, you know, who believed in this document, who were happy to have their name on this document, even though it's going to be relatively hard hitting. But more importantly, I'd like to thank each and every one of you out there who is listening to this now, who is a supporter of Legs Matters, who does what you do in terms of bringing legs matters to life we're only a small group of people none of this would be possible if we didn't have your fantastic following so i tip my hat to you and i say thank you very much at the same time i say please please get involved with the legs matters awareness week it's coming up very quickly indeed we can't wait to see your creativity of what you're able to achieve so what's our next steps with this document well, um, we are um, going to, this position paper is available to download for free. We as Legs Matters are going to be sending a copy out to every chair of the ICS and every, every lead of the devolved nation's health boards to get it on their desk. But actually, Legs Matters cannot make this document come alive. Only you can do that. Legs Matters need you. The patients need you. We need you to make the transformational change. Every person involved in wound care has a responsibility to do this, and that includes you. We don't want you to read this document. We want you to do something with it. We want you personally to help stop that complicit failure. We want you to be the change you want you, you to be the change you want to see. We cannot cope or ignore the burden any longer. So I would just like to end on, please, never more than ever before, Legs Matters needs you now. We need to stop this complicit failure. Please, please be the change you want to see. So as you can see, um, that, that was a recording from the Tissue Viability Conference a few weeks back. Um, I'm looking slightly more haggard because I've been in clinic all day and then rushed home in the rain. Um, and I'm delighted to be uh, joined this evening by my two esteemed colleagues. I've got Kate Williams, who's a tissue viability nurse within Leeds Community Healthcare Trust, along with now a recruited lecturer to the University of Huddersfield. I have got Gail Curran along my side, who's a vascular nurse specialist who's working out from Bedford now. And I'm Oh, no, it's not Bedford, of course it's not. I was trying to remember where you were, Gail. Remind me, please. Where do you work? Peterborough Hospital Peterborough. now. It's part but you of were Northwest... in Bedford. I was for a while, yeah. Part of Very West good. Anglia Healthcare Trust. Very good indeed. Yes. So, so hope you all enjoyed that. The reason why I wanted to rerun it during our Legs Matters Awareness Week is actually we think that that document stands for everything that Legs Matters stands for. We thought the session was so powerful and it actually resonated with so pe many people on the evening and we got so many questions and um, we, we just thought that actually we couldn't ignore that and um, so um please please join in with any questions we are here for 10 15 20 minutes to help and ask anybody that you can I was so so pleased to see a comment um whilst that was going on from a patient um, I won't call your name out just in case um, but then again I think oh she's put it publicly so maybe I can um, and, and basically this patient said that they've struggled to access the right care for many years um, 
And now it's resulted in a chronic condition um, and that she is able to self-care, fortunately, um, through her own individual research, it sounds like, her own individual get up and go to get this sorted. But her final words in her little bit to us was that Legs Matters has given a hope for change. And I think, good grief, if we've done that just to one person, I think we've, we're doing well. Um, so I suppose I've just got a couple of questions for um, for you two whilst, whilst I've got you this evening. So, so obviously that, that document was created way before the pandemic. You know, it, it's been on our books for two years. It, it took a year of writing and then probably a year of finessing. So, so Kate, can I ask you, you know, we described this complicit failure. Do you think that that will have got better or worse during the pandemic? I think the pandemic, it could have gone better or worse, if I'm honest. And I'm not sounding deliberately vague, but I think from a better point of view, if we start on a positive note, it has the pandemic has really pushed us into uh, ref, remote referrals, assessing people over video phone calls. Um, it's really made us rethink how we deliver care. And it from a local perspective where I work, it really made us think, how can we empower patients to share their own lower limb care with us, the clinicians? So it was really interesting listening to the video again. Um, you always pick up something different every time you listen to it. And I, um, Tracy's words really hit home with me because she was talking about self-care and that, the difference that it made to her legs. But that, in combination with that lady's comment that you've just read out, it really made me think that this self-care or shared care, whichever you want to talk about it, which was a benefit of the pandemic, it's still got to be with clinicians. It's still got to be, they've still got to be assessed. They've still got to be supported by clinicians at whatever interval suits. But that poor lady who's trying to self-care, just from trying to self-teach herself, it's the clinicians who should be teaching her to self-care. So the self-care was a good thing from the pandemic, definitely. Uh, absolutely. But, uh, and I completely get, you know, we should be empowering patients and many of us were empowering patients to look after their own legs before. You know, why? So Trace is one of our fantastic patients partner with a lived experience who was one of my patients for many years. And, and you know, why should she have to come to my clinic at a specific time of my request for me to change her bandages and you're like good grief who are we, who are we you know this, this is a mother of two with, who owns her own business so you know I enabled her to do a want and I said to Tracy when can you fit me in you know what time do you want your appointment where can I see you do you need to come first thing because I'll come in early at seven and, and open doors for you at seven if you need to or I'll stay later you know and we, we have to provide that degree of, of, of personalization because actually once we got Tracy into that stable position sometimes I didn't hear from her for three or four months now that's win-win I think from a healthcare provider's point of view of how many patients we're trying to get through Absolutely. It some of our burden but we've heard some and, and, and I think self-care is great but we have heard some terrible things that's happened through the pandemic in terms of delay in assessment inability to get hold of, of, of GP appointments or face-to-face. -face. And, and Gail, as a vascular nurse, have you seen that come out in other diseases? Because obviously Kate's uh, spoken about mostly venous leg ulcers and edema, but from mm. an arterial disease or a diabetic foot disease point of view, do you, what's your take on the pandemic and what impact that's gonna have in the future? I think, again, you know, there's been pros and cons as a result of the pandemic. I think certainly from a from a, a beneficial point of view, I think there were a lot more critical limb ischemia clinics set up for patients to have rapid access into from those that are already under podiatry care with diabetic foot wounds. However, you've then that, got that inequality of the patients that aren't with a diabetic podiatrist or, or in that system already. So may have developed wounds at home and have sat at home with with nobody then seeing them and you get the result of a patient coming to you and, and sort of appearing too late if you like and having to have an amputation as their primary treatment whereas those that can access the the rapid access clinics can hopefully have intervention earlier to reduce that risk of amputation later 
Absolutely. And, you know, one of the Legs Matters um, things is actually to do a bit of political campaigning. Mm. Um, so last night I did a parliamentary meeting with an MP from Hull, really trying to raise the health inequalities because, you know, the, the NHS at the moment is under such pressure and such strain. We, as clinicians, can't deliver the service that we want because we haven't got the capacity versus the demand. And, you know, that's very, very frustrating. But, you know, there are many things within leg ulcer care or lower limb care that actually patients are getting to the right person, but that right person is just not doing the right thing. And, and, you know, I hate the terminology that we manage wounds well, nurses manage wounds well. Mm. No, we shouldn't be managing a wound. We should be healing a wound. We should be questing for that healing, not, oh, we'll just manage that extra day. And, and hopefully this type of document really starts to shake up the commissioners, the service leaders and the nurses within those or the podiatrists, you know, to really have a, a, a question of that. We've had a comment put in to the chat to say that, you know, it's quite fashionable to have some types of diseases, you know, it is relatively fashionable to have cancer. I get where you're coming from. You know, it's quite unfashionable to have big swollen legs or leg ulcers that's weeping and smelling or toes that's going black. And, you know, some of what we're doing really is to try to normalise that too. So you'll see throughout the Legs Matters Week, we have, oh, we always try to get five starring patients to really try to normalise some of this because, it, you know, having swollen legs, is a common condition. People shouldn't feel disformed or hide away from that. Many people can be treated very successfully, but it needs to become more norm in terms of showing those conditions for us to make it more socially acceptable. So I completely get that. Then there's, there's, there's another comment um, from a, a patient saying that um, they're joining their practice patient group in the GP um, to talk about improvements and asking us if we can take the, the Legs Matters report to distribute, to look at and to see, you know, to share it. My God, absolutely yes, yes my please. Dear. Yes, please. You know, if you contact the Legs Matters through our email address, we'll send you 10 printed copies to send out to everybody that you know. So sometimes, you know, I think that, Sending things electronically, I think we can all read electronic documents, but I read that differently than having something in my hand. And, you know, if you can take this document to your GP practice and your senior practitioner within that GP reads it and starts to question, fan, dabby, doze it, I say. That's the type of thing that we meant in terms of what are you going to do about it? Because when we say that, we mean everybody that supports Legs Matters that's not just the clinicians, but that's our patient followers too. You know, we can only make this big change if we all move in the same direction. Within our little committee, if you like, we are all equal. If anything, the clinicians actually bow down to the patients for their experience rather than the other way around. Because it's you that's living with this and it's you that's got that true experience. And like Kate said, every time I listen to Tracy, she was my patient for many years, but every time I listen to her, I get a different aspect of how that impacted on her quality of life. So please, please help share, help question. If you are a leg ulcer sufferer, you know, download a copy, print it out and take it to your practitioner and say, are you aware of this? This is how I should be treated. Really question it. No practitioner will get upset about you for that because actually we're just trying to make that change. That's, I'm so pleased, Leanne, why we, that we've done this during Legs Matter Week because although that presentation originally was for a conference for professionals, I think if the public know about it and just that one woman who's going to take it to a patient practice group Imagine the change that she could achieve and then that whole practice, that whole network. It's just if the patients are linked in with their primary care services like that, they can really get influence change. It's just mm. so good. Absolutely. And it's sometimes, you know, Kate, on that, it's just sometimes about 
them knowing who to contact as well when things go wrong you know having somebody that's actually prepared to do something you know I've got a terrible family that's reaching out to me at the moment in my neighboring organization and the care that their dad's receiving they feel is just not good enough and, and you know, I'm, I can't be one that actually assesses whether that care is good enough because I'm not involved in that direct care. But I can tell you something, the communication back to that family needs to improve. I'm just thinking, you know, if we can reach out and just put the right individuals together to say the right things, we can make that biggest of difference. Um, so, you know, please, please take this document, share it. Um, you know, one of our coalition members have said that we could never work so efficiently if technology hadn't evolved. Completely agree. And, and that's why I love the Legs Matters Awareness Week being online, because online, because like I said, we'd never have got Kirsty's comments back to us. No. You know, and, and that's going to make me raise my G&T tonight and say, come on, girls, aren't we doing a fantastic job? So can I just ask you two for your final take home points then? What, what, what would you say um, to anybody that's listening from this, from a nursing point of view or from a sufferer's point of view? What would be your take home messages about the generalised leg matter and this document specifically? Okay, I'll pick on you first, if that's, that's okay. Fine. I think to take the nurses first, I think if, if you are a clinician who isn't sure about managing these conditions, there is a lot of information out there for you. Um, don't be embarrassed to say that you don't know what you're doing. Mm. Refreshingly honest, just say, I don't know what this is. I don't know what, how to treat this. So I'm not just going to keep putting posh plasters on. I'm going to find you somebody who can actually help you. So refer these patients on and to specialist services, vascular services, leg ulcer clinics, and then try and educate yourself and your colleagues on how to manage them in the future. For the patients, it's... It's all about, but not, I was going to say demanding, but we don't want to cause riots. But it's just about knowing what to expect so you know what good care looks like. If you're not getting it, ask to be referred. It could be that your practice aren't um, pretty skilled in leg care. So they need to work on that. But in the meantime, you've still got a problem that needs dealing with. So ask for an onward referral. There will be some services within your locality you might have to travel half an hour or so into a larger city if you live in the country, but there will be services that you can access that can help you. So if you're not, if your leg isn't improving or your foot isn't improving, ask to be referred on to a specialist service. Lovely. Thank you so much for those, Kate. And Gail, your take-home messages? I think, again, as Kate said, I think education, acknowledging your limitations as a healthcare professional. If you don't know, ask and access other healthcare professionals around you and go and spend time with them you know everybody's more than happy to have you know a practice nurse or a, a tissue viability nurse come into clinic in a hospital or podiatry clinic you know get some experience and then access education or courses there's they're out there from the universities and from industry and understand really get an understanding about lower limb ulceration and what causes it what's the underlying issues not just managing the 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 um the consequences of the ulceration and again for the patients i think also you know asking to be educated yourself about your ulcer what is it what's causing it question it you know why don't you know what's causing it who can you refer me to to find out what's causing it um you know you don't have to sit and live with a leg ulcer we can't heal all leg ulcers. We know we've all got difficult ones out there that we just have to accept that we can't heal those. However, the majority of these leg ulcers shouldn't be lasting for as long as they should. Thank you so much, Gail. And, and I would just echo that. You know, Kate, Gail and myself weren't born knowing everything about vascular disease or leg ulceration. We also knew nothing at one point in our career. And the only reasons why we know about it now is that we questioned, we asked, we educated, we were eager to know. So be the future. If you are a young nurse within your 20s, why don't you become the next generation of Legs Matters? We need you. Get enthusiastic. It's a lovely space to work in is lower limb disease. 
Mm -hmm. Like they've been said, escalate. And that's from a patient point of view or from a clinician point of view. There's always somewhere you can go that, you know, in terms of escalating that. That might be from a patient point of view, from your, uh, from the, from the, the nurse or the podiatrist to the GP, to the practice manager, to your pals, to your MP. There's lots of ways that you can escalate. There's, if you are questioning the quality of your care, by all means question it. And I would just say thinking and reflecting about Kirsty, if there are any patients out there that want to make the biggest of difference, get involved in your healthcare just like Kirsty has. Ask to join that patient board within your GP to shape their services. There are many patient groups out there that we struggle to fill the patient places. We want people with lived experience. So if you are that type of person, why don't you help us in terms of making that change, seeking out where we need those patients' voices desperately? So thank you all for listening. Thank you all for your amazing support of Legs Matters. Um, it's absolutely amazing what you do for us. We are so, so proud of this campaign. And I'm very, very proud of you. Thank you so much. And thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.